Xenophon sits alone in his tent, thinking about the situation he's just found himself in. He and 10,000 other Greek mercenaries are trapped deep inside Persia, and he wasn't even supposed to be there. When Persian calls for Greek mercenaries reached Xenophon, he consulted his mentor, Socrates, on whether or not he should answer them. Socrates advised that it would be better to ask the oracle at Delphi, but Xenophon, who really wanted to go, played a little trick on the oracle. Instead of asking whether he should go, he instead asked which god he should sacrifice to to ensure success. At that point, the answer didn't matter. And so, Xenophon entered the service of the Persian prince Cyrus. Alongside 10,000 other Greek mercenaries, it was his mission to help Cyrus win a Persian civil war and take the empire from his brother. Unfortunately, in the final battle, Cyrus was killed, but his Greek expedition survived. So their generals were forced to enter talks with the victors to negotiate safe passage back to Greece. It sure was a crummy situation, but at least Xenophon didn't have to deal with it. All he had to do was sit back and wait for the news that the army would be marching home. A messenger then enters his tent. He says, Great news, Xenophon, sir! What is it? Xenophon asks. The messenger replies, Did I say great news? I meant terrible news! The Persians executed all of our generals! What? You're next in line to command! What? Please get me home, sir! I don't want to die! What? You can call me Ezekiel. This is Xenophon's Expedition of the 10,000. Let's jump in! Now, before we get into things, I want to discuss our main source for these events. It's Xenophon himself. Of course, a historian writing about himself is bound to have a bit more bias than usual. But from what I can tell, Xenophon chose to follow in Thucydides' gigantic footsteps and strive to be as objective as possible. So with our source established, back to our story. So, what were 10,000 Greek mercenaries doing in the middle of the Persian Empire anyway? Well, Cyrus hired them, obviously. But why did he choose to hire Greeks, specifically? The answer is that at this time, the Greeks raised quite possibly the finest heavy infantry on Earth. So while the Persians were experts at warfare on horseback, they kinda sucked at fighting on foot. So to get himself an edge in the Civil War, Cyrus spent a fortune to bring experienced Greek warriors like Xenophon over to his side. But with his defeat, those Greek mercenaries were now trapped hundreds of miles from home, surrounded by enemies, and without any clear leadership. Except, of course, for Xenophon. Now, Xenophon's rise to power wasn't quite as simple as I made it out to be. Rather than being next in line of a clear chain of command, the expedition was kind of an ad hoc moving democracy. At the suggestion of Xenophon, an Athenian, each unit of soldiers would elect a commander to represent them on a sort of executive committee, and, also at his suggestion, the committee then elected him to be its chief executive. So now the democratically elected CEO of the 10,000, Xenophon set about creating a plan to get them home. The route they'd take was simple. The expedition would march north, directly to the Black Sea. To move as quickly as possible, they'd keep their supply train to a minimum, and take additional supplies along the way. Upon reaching the Black Sea, they would be close to large Greek colonies from whom they could request or extort the ships they'd need to take them back to Greece. To execute this plan, the first thing that the expedition had to do was get away from the Persian army, as it was uncomfortably close by. Usually, this would be as simple as just getting up and walking away, but the Persians presented a unique obstacle. Remember how I said that Greeks made great heavy infantry, while Persians were superior in the saddle? Well, every time the Greeks started to march, they'd come under attack by Persian cavalry and skirmishers. And since the Greeks were pretty much all heavy infantry, the Persians could make hit-and-run attacks all day, and the Greeks couldn't do anything about it. But Xenophon found a solution. Many of the carts in their small supply train were pulled by horses, so he had these horses replaced with pack animals, and found experienced riders to fight atop them. With this little trick, the Greeks were able to create a force of around 50 horsemen, but even for cavalry, that's not a lot. Not to mention the fact that they probably were less experienced than their Persian opponents. So the Greeks would need additional light soldiers to support them, and those soldiers would come from the island of Rhodes. Men from the island of Rhodes were famous for their skill with a sling. A particularly nasty trick of theirs was using light ammunition instead of stones. According to Xenophon, this gave Rhodian slingers twice the range of their Persian counterparts. Once all of the men from Rhodes were gathered and equipped, the expedition's cavalry could count on the support of 200 expert slingers. But even that wouldn't be enough. Because right after these new units were formed, the Persians sent a particularly large force in their next attack, and with the intent of capturing the entire expedition. This called for a total change in tactics. Instead of simply waiting for the Persians to attack and then defending themselves, the Greeks tricked them into crossing a gully. Then, instead of using the Rhodian slinger's superior range to attack early, they waited for the Persians to get into their own slinger's range. This meant that if the Persians tried to retreat, the Rhodians could continue shooting them for quite a while. 
And finally, the Greeks positioned their heavy infantry to pursue the Persians, ideally trapping them in the gully. When it was time for the Greeks to attack, the fighting didn't last long. The Persians were so used to attacking an enemy that couldn't defend itself that at the first sign of serious resistance, they panicked and ran. In the ensuing chaos, many Persians were killed, and Xenophon even claims to have captured 80 Persian cavalrymen. The Greeks had just performed a nearly perfect rearguard action, and their commander, Xenophon, basically figured out how to do it on the fly. As the army proceeded north, the threat of Persian attack shrank, but a new enemy presented itself, the Cardusians. The Cardusians were fiercely independent people, and for a long time, a thorn in the side of the Persian Empire. The Greeks thought that the Cardusians might welcome them into their territory. After all, they were both fighting Persia, but every village the Greeks found was abandoned. Low on supplies, the Greeks looted necessities, but in an effort not to antagonize anyone, they didn't touch any valuables. However, the Cardusians clearly didn't appreciate any of these gestures, because that night, a small band of Cardusians attacked the tail of the Greek column, killing several. The expedition's commanders knew that things would only get worse from here, so to speed up their march through this hostile country, they left behind all of their slaves and all but the strongest pack animals. This left the army only with what it needed to march and to defend itself. And so, the Greeks and Cardusians fought a brutal campaign of harassment and rearguard actions through narrow mountain passes. This was a style of warfare the Cardusians excelled at, since that's how they always fought the Persians. But in the end, after clearing far too many occupied passes, hilltops, and peaks, the Greeks made their way through Cardusian territory, and into Armenia. About this leg of the march, Xenophon commented, The Greeks spent seven days marching through Cardusian territory. There were battles every single day, and they suffered more losses than on all occasions they had clashed with the king and his Afarnes put together. Lucky for our exhausted Greeks, aside from some trouble at a river crossing, Armenia proved to be a far friendlier country than Cordun. Shortly after their arrival, the governor of western Armenia offered the Greeks a truce, and the right to take whatever provisions they needed so long as no houses were burned down. The expedition's commanders accepted these terms, and with that, the men could finally rest easy. Or at least as easy as they could with the governor's army tailing them. Just in case. But just in case of what? Why, just in case the governor decided to attack the Greeks, of course. And according to a recently captured prisoner, that's exactly what he was going to do. So a small detachment of light infantry, on their own initiative, single-handedly attacked the Armenian camp. Remarkably, the Armenians panicked and ran, meaning that this small force of light infantry both defeated an entire enemy army and managed to capture many valuables and prisoners. With Armenia suddenly turning hostile, the Greeks decided that it might be a good idea to get out of there as quickly as possible. However, a combination of low supplies, heavy snow, and brutal cold caused more and more of the Greeks to suffer from attrition. Xenophon, who was leading the rearguard, encountered depressed and starving men by the side of the road. Sometimes, he could convince them to resume marching. But other times, he had to resort to trickery and even force to keep them moving. Xenophon was going to get his boys home, whether they wanted it or not. After exiting Armenia, the situation improved somewhat, although local resistance continued to be a problem. Eventually, the Greeks happened upon a particularly defensible stronghold manned by civilians throwing rocks, but the expedition was nearing the end of their long march, so they weren't going to let something silly like barbarian civilians stop them. After applying that unique combination of bravery, intelligence, and high-risk improvisation that the expedition was famous for, the Greeks took the stronghold, but not before they were forced to witness a harrowing sight. The women threw their children off of the stronghold's cliffs, and the adults jumped after them. One of the Greeks attempted to capture a civilian, but instead of being taken prisoner, the civilian dragged the Greek off the cliff with him, killing them both. After that horror, the 10,000 could at least comfort themselves in the knowledge that they were close to their destination. And so, after more marching, something strange happened. Xenophon, still commanding the all-important rearguard, heard shouting from the front of the column. Were they under attack? So Xenophon requisitioned a horse and rode to the front. As he rode, the noise got louder. Soon, Xenophon saw what was happening. The column dispersed into a crowd standing in awe at the terrain in front of them. They were all shouting, Thalata, Thalata, the sea, the sea. The expedition had finally arrived at the Black Sea. They were almost home. But first, they had to fight one last battle. After turning west and marching through land controlled by friendly natives, they encountered an army of another tribe, the Colchins, defending a vital pass. Xenophon knew that this would be the final obstacle between the expedition and the Greek world, so to ensure success, he made a speech to his men. Men, the enemy troops you can see are all that stands between us and the place we have so long been determined to reach. We must find a way to eat them alive. The Greeks, inspired, desperate, and perhaps a little pissed off at the Colchians for trying to stop them at the end of their long journey, charged. The Greeks barely even reached Colchian lines before they broke into a rout. From here, it was only a short journey to the Greek colonies, and from there, 
home. However, the expedition consisted of an adventurous lot. So rather than return directly home, they instead set about finding new mercenary work, which had the effect of upsetting every Greek city and local tribe that had the misfortune of hosting them. But that's outside the scope of this video, because this has been Xenophon's Expedition of the Ten Thousand. Up next, we're going to talk about a much more modern military conflict, or more specifically, some of the literature it inspired. I'll see you then.